Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you again today and enjoy that we have the opportunity to come before you, praising you for the countless blessings that you've given to us. And as we get ready for yet another blessing, the blessing of opening your word, Lord, I just ask that it be your spirit that is speaking. Lord God, despite my weakness, despite my human frailty, Lord God, just work through my voice, Lord, so that it is your voice that we hear, your wisdom that it is brought forth. I thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to learn from you. In Christ's name. Amen. Well, um, you know, walking outside today and um, feeling the temperature and then driving along and, and looking at the fact that it was 53 degrees in the middle of May, I have a question. What happened to our summer? I mean, yeah. Global warming, yes. What happened to global warming? More like global cooling, right? You know, hey, hey, I like wearing sweaters, but you know, it's, anyway. Um, summer also brings along with it a lot of invitations, doesn't it? There's graduation invitations. Uh, there are wedding invitations. There are graduation party invitations. There's so many different invitations, quite frankly, it's very hard for me to keep up a lot of times with them. There are also those invitations you get on the phone sometimes, like, hey, congratulations, you've won a free cruise to the Bahamas. You ever get those? Yeah. There's that invitation. Or the invitation, hey, drive down to Dallas. If you drive down to Dallas and you sit through this long seminar where these salesmen are trying to convince you of something, you can actually stay for free in the hotel. Or those other kinds of whatever, salesmanship invitations, business invitations. Lots of invitations. But the most important invitation that we can look at is one found in Acts 2.38, which is our memory verse. Acts 2.38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This was an amazing invitation that was given to the people of Jerusalem at this time and it is one that continues today for us to repent and be baptized, every one of us, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that this is a holiday, by the way? Oh, come on. I know you guys know that it's a holiday of sorts. But, right, it is a holiday. This holiday is Pentecost. Normally we combine, and we have a, a combined service on Pentecost this year or not. But this is a holiday. Well, what is a holiday, by the way? Look at the word. Holy day, right? Holy day. Holy meaning separate, put apart, a special day of celebration, and it many times a religious thing. And in this case, Pentecost is a holy day for us. The invitation we just read about was extended actually on that day, on Pentecost, for the very first time in recorded history on a very specific Pentecost that we're going to talk about. But what was the reason for the holiday? I mean, what, why, why the holiday in the first place? We know about holidays like Memorial Day. We know about Christmas. We know about Easter and Thanksgiving. What was the reason that the Jews celebrated Pentecost? What was that all about? 
And not only that, what happened to transform that Jewish holiday into a Christian one for us? Well, first we see that this was a faithful gathering. This Pentecost, this basically, if you want to go with, we don't know exactly what year it was because we don't know exactly the year that Christ was born and was crucified. We can say, you know, the year 33 if you want. But at this Pentecost, at this very special Pentecost, this was a faithful gathering. And you know, there are several faithful gatherings in history. For example, in June 28, 1914, there was a very faithful gathering. People coming together, not necessarily knowing what was going to happen, but seeing something dramatic happen. On June 28, 1914 in Sarajevo, there was a state visit being made by a guy by the name of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And he and his wife Sophie had come to Sarajevo. Uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They had come there on this state visit. They had an itinerary, and everything went wrong on the itinerary. Very, various things were happening, complicated by the fact that there was a small separatist group called the Black Hand. And there were six assassins there, and their goal was to kill Franz Ferdinand. Okay? And this, this group was not made of polished terrorists and things like that. Uh, a lot of them were teenagers. And they had gotten together and they had put themselves on the route and they had determined that they were going to kill Franz Ferdinand. Well, you know, they're not very good, quite frankly, at what they do. Franz Ferdinand, his convoy is, is coming by, his procession. He's in the third car. It's an open car. Um, passes a couple of the assassins. They, they mess up. Another one manages to throw a bomb. It goes and it bounces off the back of the car, misses them, explodes behind them, and actually disables the next car. That causes everybody to panic. The convoy goes on and passes the other three assassins. It looks like everything is just basically done for as far as the assassination plot. Gets there, Ferdinand's obviously upset where he wants to go. They decide to completely change their itinerary, go someplace else. They head off. Communication wasn't given to the drivers, though, so the drivers started going the, the, the right, what was originally the right way, and then they were told, no, 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 you got to reverse. And so as Franz Ferdinand's car is going down one road, they say, no, you got to reverse. And so the car stops. And at that point, there is this guy by the name of Gabrielo Princi, 19 years old. He is able to get within five feet because the car stopped and about to reverse. Five feet of Franz Ferdinand opens fire. You think, five feet, hey, no problem, right? Except he's not that great a shot. It does kill Franz Ferdinand, but you think at five feet he's going to be able to get him really good. It gets him in the juggler. And his wife, Sophie, gets up to protect her husband and he's trying to shoot the governor and instead shoots Sophie. Gets off two shots, pretty wild, and ends up killing them both. Okay, mission accomplished. You think, wow, this just things worked out, this gathering. Some guy got assassinated. And yet that assassination led directly to World War I, in which we see 16 million people killed. And because of World War I and the aftermath of World War I, the Versailles Treaty that punished Germany and the Austrian and Hungarian Empire, etc., etc., you saw the rise of Hitler, and eventually 60 million people killed in World War II, including 6 million Jews. And what started it? This faithful gathering, this one event where a kind of young assassin gets lucky and leads to millions and millions of deaths. Faithful gathering. 
world changing as this event was, it is nothing in comparison to what happened at Pentecost. Because what happened at Pentecost changed the entire course of human history. What we see here at this gathering is something totally miraculous. Well, let's give you a little bit of background. What was this for? In, this wasn't always called Pentecost. It's actually in Hebrew called Shavuot. The Shavuot is basically in translation, it means week of weeks. It's basically seven periods of seven, 49 days. Shavuot came directly after Passover. They started counting, boom, 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 all the way to this time. Passover, in addition to sacrificing the lamb, okay, in recognition of what had happened back uh, when the Israelites were free from Egypt, was also a time that it was the very first of the grain harvest in Israel. The barley is coming to bloom, it is ready to go, it's ready to be harvested. Afterwards, after the period of time, 49 weeks, we have the wheat harvest. So this whole period right here is basically the grain harvest. And so through this, this period, it's so important not only for Passover, but also what's coming up with Shavuot, that Shavuot becomes what is known as one of three festivals, which are known as the Shalos Redilim. Shalos Redilim is three primary pilgrimage festivals that Jews, observant Jews, had to go to. So that's why all these people are in Jerusalem at this time. Okay, it's a huge deal. It's not only celebrating the grain, though. According to Jewish tradition, this was also the giving of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. So it was a really big deal for all these people to be gathered in Jerusalem for Shavuot. Shavuot, by the way, in Greek, because it's actually 50 days, right? Because there's Passover and then there's the 49 days, is called Pentecost, which means 50. That's where we get our name for it. So, background on the holiday. But there was another reason that the disciples were in Jerusalem that day. Look at Acts 1, 3 through 9. Christ, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, oh, sorry. And then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. In this moment, what is going on? You see that Christ is saying, you guys need to stay in Jerusalem. Something's about to happen. Something miraculous. Give to the Holy Spirit. This is going to be really, really cool. You guys need to stay here. So, they stay. Now, this is day 40, right? And so they have 10 more days. They have to stay and wait. And they don't know when it's going to come. It could be 10 days. It could be a year. They don't know. They just know that sometime this Holy Spirit, this gift of the Holy Spirit is going to come. And they don't know what that means. But they're waiting and they're praying for that. But it happens at Shavuot. It happens at Pentecost. And we'll talk later about the reasoning for that as well. So at this faithful gathering, we see, though, three basic types of participants. Three types of participants all gathered here in, in, this, in this location. 
Now, all events include a variety of participants, right? If you go to a soccer game, who are the participants? The players. The players. Who else? What? Coaches. Coaches are there. Who else? Referees. Referees. They better be there, right? Who else? The fans. The fans. Fans are there, right? There's all these different participants that are there, that are involved in making the soccer game. With a wedding, what do you have? You have the bride, you have the groom, you have the pastor, you have all the people, right, watching it, the witnesses. Different people coordinating different things. Every event has a variety of participants. At this time, there were lots of people in Jerusalem, not just Jews, not just, you know, people who were really seeking after God. But there were basically, you know, here we have the Jews, we have the practicing, we have the secular, we have Romans, we have foreigners, we have all of these people gathering here at this time of Shabbat. But in this event, there are still three main participant types. The first is the sharers. Acts 2, 1 through 4. We read about these guys. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. How would you react? They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Whenever I read that passage, every time I can just see that, and I think to myself, wow, how absolutely incredible that must have been. You're, you're sitting there, you're praying, and then all of a sudden, right? You hear this wind, and then you start seeing these flames, and they come and they land on you, and then all of a sudden, you're filled with this something. You begin to speak in another language. It had to have been absolutely Incredible. But the thing about these sharers, these people, who were they? They were people who had been discipled, right? These were people who had been with Jesus. They had learned about them. They had been trained by Jesus. Jesus had spent time with them, telling them, preparing them. These were people who had heard who he was, not only just heard, but had experienced him in many ways. They were also ready for service. They were ready for service. Christ had come. They had seen who Christ was. And they were now, their hearts were open to be ready for service. Ready to receive. Receive from God this, this amazing gift. There's a second type there. Acts 2, 5 through 12. We see the seekers. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our, in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? I mean, what would it be like? What would it be like if all of a sudden our worship team up here, they're caught in the middle of worship, and suddenly they stop. And they begin speaking in other tongues. Witnessing about God. Like Peter up here witnessing in Chinese. Fluent. I mean, I would faint dead away. Right? I mean, Wow, you know, uh, uh, what would it be like to experience that? And so these people, they're looking at it and they're going, whoa, 
But there's something about these people, these seekers. What does it say? They're God theory. They're God theory. These are people that, not that they have no idea who God is, they know who God is. And they fear God. But they don't necessarily have a relationship with God. But they fear Him. They understand Him. They have a respect for Him. They're seeking the truth. And they have come together. They've come together for Shabbat, for this, this celebration, out of a fear, out of respect for God. They are seeking truth. But there's a third type this year as well. Acts 2.13, these are the skeptics. The skeptics said, some, however, made fun of them and said, ha, ha, they've had too much wine. I don't know about you, but if I hear somebody who never was able to speak a language, suddenly speaking a language fluently, I would think to myself, it's not because they were drunk. You know? But have you met people like that? That no matter what happens spiritually, that they're always going to debunk it. They're always going to say, oh man, I don't believe in that stuff. I don't believe in that stuff. Yeah. These are the skeptics. These are the ones who anything spiritual, anything supernatural, they can't accept. Man, I believe in science. I believe in something that I can see and I can, you know, anything else they're not willing to accept. In the midst of this amazing occurrence, though, we suddenly see Peter step forward and he addresses the crowd. And what he basically says in summary is this. He addresses, he says, the Jews and the others living in Rome. And he says basically that basically Jesus had become the Messiah. He was here. But he was crucified. And guess what? You crucified him. That he had been prophesied this was going to happen. And here he is. You did it. You crucified your Messiah. Hmm. Wow. Now, if it had just been Peter talking about that, probably not much would have happened, right? But the thing is, is God's Spirit was the one reaching out to those seekers that day through Him. One of the most freeing things about serving God is the knowledge that you and I, we're not responsible for the results. You know, a salesman, those guys on the telephone, the telecom people, telecommunicators, thing is, is that they have a quota they have to realize. I mean, if you're not going to buy from them after they do their pattern, hang out, go call the next guy, right? They've got to do that. The salesman, the car, car salesman, man, he's got to be good. He's got to know the pattern. He's got to know the, the look. He's got to be able to flatter you a little bit and do this kind of thing because he's earning a commission on those cars. If he doesn't sell enough cars, guess what? His boss says, I'm sorry, get out of here. We're going to have to get somebody else. It's all the results. So he has got his A game down. An entertainer is the same way, right? A musician, uh, an actor. If they don't bring enough record sales in, if they don't bring enough people at the box office, they're not going to get a role again. Or they're not going to get their record contract renewed. Right? Because they are results driven. They have to have it there. But the thing about a Christian, whether we reach 10,000 people in our lifetime, or zero people come to Christ, it's not us that gets the result. We have to be faithful. We have to do what we're told. We have to follow God's leading. But the results, they're not up to us. They're not up to us. In our Bible study, we've been studying 1 Corinthians. And just this last week, we talked about 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7, among other things. Pop that one up. It says, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. Paul's talking here. But God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But only God who makes things grow. 
It really doesn't matter, really, when you share, if you are stuttering. It doesn't matter if, boy, you're really nervous. It doesn't really matter if you're not the best speaker in the world. If you're being obedient, it's God talking through you. And He's the one that gets the results, not you. That doesn't mean that you should, you know, deliberately try to mess up or anything like that. It just means that we don't have to worry about it. Because it's God that gives the increase. Look at John 6, 44. Kind of goes along with this. It says, no one can come to me, this is Christ saying, unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. In other words, it's God's Spirit that's doing the work. It's not us. It's not us. However, that does mean, as I said earlier, that does not mean that we just be lazy. Look at 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. In other words, you need to be one who knows this book. We talk about this a lot. But you need to know this book. You need to study it. You need to know what it says so that you can rightly interpret it. So that someone talks to you and asks you about a question, you can point them to a passage. You need to be familiar with this. Really familiar. You know, quite frankly, I have a hard time, hard enough time convincing myself of something not to mention other people. But the beauty is I don't have to. And neither do you. Back in the Great Awakening, we talked before about a guy by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Enfield, Connecticut, 1741. Second time he delivers a sermon called in the, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards was not a dynamic speaker. He really wasn't. He, he got up and he did, read with some emotion, but he basically just read it like this. You know, maybe looking up occasionally, reading the prepared sermon that he had. And yet, the Holy Spirit moved so much that the people in the audience were sobbing. They were crying. He got to the point he had to stop several times as the ushers went around and tried to keep people calm. People were literally falling out of the pews. They were sobbing by what he was reading, by what the Spirit was doing. And they were shouting out sometimes, interrupting him, saying, What shall I do to be saved? Was it Edwards? It was the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of God moving. So instead of whole hum when Peter is speaking, what instead we see is God's Spirit bringing the story to a life-changing conclusion. Like what happened in Enfield, Connecticut, the seekers in Jerusalem were absolutely devastated by what they were hearing, by what was coming out of Peter's mouth by the Holy Spirit. And we see how they responded and the results of that response in Acts 2, 37-41. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and get this, in about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 were added to their number that day. So this crowd, we see people responding 
and saying, brothers, what shall we do? What? Does that sound familiar? What did, what was in Edward's time? What was the question again? What were they saying? What shall I do to be saved? See, this was a movement of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit moves, we are compelled to respond. We are compelled to respond because we come to the end of ourselves and we realize our guilt before God. And we realize just how desperately we need it. There is also great symbolic significance to the timing of this massive coming to Christ. And we cannot... It's a really interesting study sometimes if you, if you want to do it. But there's no way in our time, etc. we can do it justice. But John 12, 24 mentions this. Christ is talking. He says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, if you take a kernel of wheat and you drop it in the ground and it gets the water, etc., it produces a stalk that has lots and lots of seeds on it, right? Well, we talked about how at Passover, Christ is crucified. If you look at the crucifixion of Christ, it is the crucifixion just like symbolically like the Passover lamb, right? But something else happened on Passover you may not be familiar with. After Passover was over, the people would go out into their fields because this is the time of the grain harvest, right? And they would go, each family would go out into their fields and they would gather a sheaf of grain, which is an amount of grain. They'd take their side and they would cut that and they would bring it to the high priest. And the high priest would then take this sheaf, which is called an omer in Hebrew, take this sheaf, and wave it like a wave offering to God. Okay? So that is symbolic. That, the, that seed that has fallen down, that has now reproduced. Okay? Once again, waving that up there. But then, after the 49 days, etc., they take that grain, they take that grain, and they make bread out of it. And the bread is then presented to on the altar. Do you, do you catch some of that symbolism? And we're not really going into it that, that far. But another name, by the way, other than the Festival of Weeks, which is for Pentecost or Shavuot, another day, a name is the Day of the First Fruits, which we see in Numbers. It's the first fruits coming. What happened at Pentecost for the Christians? The first fruits. We see these first fruits brought about by the death of Christ, brought about by the Holy Spirit coming in and like leaven and bread, just completely changing everything. And then the presentation of the first fruits, those first disciples, those first converts coming. It's a fascinating, if you go and you study scripture, you see the symbolism of flour and grain and all of this. It's amazing how this all worked together. What happened at Pentecost was absolutely phenomenal. But let's not forget about the epilogue. The epilogue. See, all great stories, especially the true ones, need an epilogue to see how the event continued to affect the precipitants' lives in the future. And here's what happened after Pentecost. <coughs> Acts 2, 42-47. These new converts, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. 
praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your spiritual ancestry. This is the birth of the church. And this is what the church should look like. We've come a long way since. And oftentimes we've gotten off track. But this is our heritage. Pentecost is this amazing holiday because it celebrates basically who we are as believers. It celebrates that beginning, that coming together, the birth of the church, of us following God. Wouldn't it be cool if we could have people being added to our number daily? But what does that require us to be? That requires us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That requires us to be, once again, the sharers. That requires us to allow God to work in us, to allow Him to speak through us, and to live His life through us. It requires us to truly be changed. So the question is, who are you in the Pentecost story? You see, that first day may be history, but the spiritual movement that was begun at Pentecost still continues. And like then, there are still three main participants. Are you a sheriff? Are you a person who is absolutely committed? You have been discipled. You have studied. You are to the point that you're saying, God, here I am. Just use me. However you see fit. I am willing to be used by you, Lord. I am willing for your spirit to speak through me and change the world. Or, perhaps you're not there. Perhaps you're not a Christian. Perhaps you are a person who has come here and you're a seeker. You, you have a respect for God. You know there's someone up there. You know... That he is important, that you need to follow him, but you, you haven't really understood the truth. I'd love a chance to share with you. Scott, Dana, any Timothy, we'd love to sit down with you and share with you what that means. Who Christ is and how your life can be completely changed. Or are you a skeptic? You're here because, hey, you know, the food can be pretty good. We got refreshments coming up. And I like my friends. I enjoy hanging out here. Or, man, you know, I'm just kidding. My parents make me come. I'd be home instead, playing a video game or sleeping, watching TV, whatever it may be. Are you a skeptic? Are you the kind of person that's like, oh, well, you, that's okay for you guys, but not for me. That's the worst place for you to be. Because you're missing the boat. In the end, you're going to miss Christ and eternity with Him. The thing is, the Holy Spirit is still speaking. Still speaking to us today. Still wanting to work through us today. The question is, are you listening? Are you listening? Father, I thank you for being Thank you for that amazing experience, that faithful gathering, Lord, where the world was changed. 
And I thank you for the church that resulted from that, the church that was able to grow and to touch us. I thank you for those people in our lives who have told us about Jesus, who have been used by your spirit, Lord, to share. spiritual corporate birthday today. What an amazing holiday. What an amazing celebration this is. I must ever be mindful, Lord, of all that you've done for us through the church. All that you've done for us through your Holy Spirit speaking and using people. And Lord, help us not to just sit complacent Help us to also open our hearts, Lord, to be used by you. Help us to carry it forward, Lord. Help us to carry forward the blessing that we have received to the world around us, Lord. Lord, may we be willing to be used. And I also want to pray, Lord, for those seekers here, those who don't know you. Those who, who fear you, they understand that there is a God out there, Lord, but that they, they desperately need you. I just pray, Lord, that you will use us sharers to show them the way. And that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will be the one who brings the increase. And Lord, if there are skeptics here, Lord, I pray. Wake up and see that the answers are not in science. It's not science alone, but it's science and spirituality. It's all part and parcel of what you created. So Lord, I just pray that if there are skeptics here, that your spirit will touch them. We have an awesome responsibility. Help us not to let another moment pass without being willing to be used by you, being changed by you.